Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On this episode of Frankly Speaking, we hear from His Royal Highness Prince Turkey Al Faisal, former Chief of General Intelligence Directorate in Saudi Arabia and former US and UK Ambassador. We ask him how the crisis in Gaza can be resolved, if he believes that Israel's military action should be considered a genocide and whether a peace deal between Saudi and Israel is now forever off the table. Your Highness, thank you very much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, it's been close to two years since you last joined us on our program. The last time we spoke, you put forward the hypothesis that there was no tangible evidence to suggest that Arab normalization agreements not contingent on advancing Palestinian rights had made Israel less aggressive towards Palestinians or made their lives any easier. Frankly speaking, do you think we are living the failure of the Abraham Accords? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on this program. It's a very uh, wonderful opportunity, not only to see you and talk to you, but also, I think, to share with you and your audience uh, some of the thoughts that uh, come about on these very important issues. Definitely, I think it is not just a failure of the Abrahamic Accords, so-called, uh, but it's a failure of the world community since the Israeli occupation uh, of Palestine. Uh, it's more than uh, 75 years since the creation of, uh, of Israel, and yet uh, we're still, uh, as it were, um, walking uh, in place uh, without moving forward on uh, establishing a Palestinian state with uh, Palestinian rights and uh, the necessity of peace between Israel and its neighbors. So uh, I hope that uh, the recent events have convinced the world of the need to um, walk the walk uh, and not only talk the talk about establishing peace in the Middle East. Well, you've said the events of October 7 awakened the world to the Palestinian cause once more and the suffering inflicted on them by an occupier. But since the October 7 attacks and the launch of the Israeli military retaliation, you've been quite vocal in your condemnation of both Hamas as well as the Israeli government. Do you still think that both sides are to blame or has the blame shifted more towards Israel given the horrific toll its military campaign has had on civilian lives? Well, I think there is blame to share all around uh, and not just on the Palestinians and the Israelis, but as I said before, on the world community for allowing the situation to come to this uh, stage of uh, brutal, uh, vicious, and murderous uh, uh, tit for tat between Hamas and, and Israel. Um, I think uh, uh, sharing the blame should include everybody and not just they. But definitely the, the killing that is taking place has been monstrous, uh, more monstrous on the part of Israel than it has been on the part of Hamas, because Israel has, has displayed a, a horrific uh, disregard for all uh, norms of, of uh, warfare and, uh, and international law and humanitarian uh, considerations. So uh, that is uh, something to keep in mind. Well, there's been a huge outcry about the deliberate targeting of civilians, of Israel restricting aid into Gaza. You personally have criticised this too. In a speech at Rice University in Houston in October, you accused the Israelis of indiscriminate bombing of innocent Palestinian civilians in Gaza, as well as the indiscriminate arrest of Palestinian children, women and men in the West Bank. Do you think Israel's military campaign in Gaza does amount to a breach of the Genocide Convention? I'm not the only one who believes that. I think uh, we've seen the reaction of uh, the world uh, populations everywhere. 
the demonstrations that have gone out in the streets of major cities in Europe, in America, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, everywhere you go, people have gone out in the streets condemning is Israel's brutal attacks on the Palestinian people in general, and more specifically in Gaza. And definitely the ICG has uh, already said that uh, there are grounds to believe that Israel uh, is committing uh, genocide in, in these territories. So uh, I'm not the only one who believes that. So tell me, what do you make of the South African efforts at the ICJ? Do you see the verdict that came out in January as purely symbolic? Will it have any real consequences, given that Israel has essentially ignored it so far? Do you think we're beginning to see justice for Palestinians? Well, the Israelis are, are you know, just there uh, portraying themselves as uh, innocent bystanders, if you like, or victims of, uh, of Hamas uh, brutality, when they're the ones who are committing the major crimes there. And the ICG definitely has uh, put its mark on, on, on the world uh, to require the end of the hostilities there and the stopping of the carnage that Israel is causing. Well, we've seen South Africa petitioning the court in The Hague again, ordering for measures to be placed on Israel. Meanwhile, Israel has called South Africa's actions outrageous. They claim they are allowing aid in, and yet we see other horrific cases like the siege at Al Shifa Hospital earlier this week. The Palestinians appear totally helpless against this very huge, powerful Israeli force. Now, in your speech at Rice University several months ago, you said, I do not support the military option to resist Israeli occupation in Palestine. I prefer civil insurrection and disobedience. Well, that may be the case, but Palestinians would argue they've already tried that. They've been shot in their kneecaps. They've had both their leaders as well as very young minors arrested on terrorism charges. So, Prince Turkey, if I can ask, what can the Palestinians do in very practical terms to resist this illegal occupation? Well, I've mentioned several examples where uh, civil insurrection and uh, uh, resistance uh, has proved to be more uh, efficient and more uh, capable of achieving the, the, uh, the ends of, uh, of uh, ending colonialism, for example, in India. Um, in South Africa, uh, as well, uh, there are good examples of, of civil insurrection and, and disobedience uh, achieving for the South African people their freedom from apartheid. Um, and so uh, I have seen no results for uh, the military uh, resistance that uh, not just Hamas, but other groups uh, in uh, Palestine have uh, undertaken against Israeli forces. The odds are overwhelmingly in that sense in favor of Israel. It has more military capability, it is being uh, supported by the United States and the West in its military uh, supplies, etc. Uh, whereas uh, Hamas and other parties in Palestine um, are limited in their ability to uh, not only resist that military capability of Israel, but to launch its own uh, military capabilities. And the main uh, consequence of that is that uh, the Israelis have this overwhelming ability to kill uh, thousands of Palestinians. So uh, that is why I think uh, civil insurrection and disobedience is a much more um, efficient and uh, uh, results-oriented uh, campaign rather than the military attempts by Hamas and other parties in Palestine. But after a 75-year occupation, it feels like civil insurrection and disobedience clearly is not working. Well, I have not seen civil uh, insurrection and disobedience of the scale that were practiced in, uh, in India and in other places to remove the colonial yoke from their backs. Uh, and I'd like to see more of that in the Palestinian lands against the, uh, the Israeli occupation. That's where I come from. Uh, in my view about uh, military uh, resistance to, uh, to Israel. I'd like to see more of that uh, happening, uh, not just in, uh, in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. 
Okay, so let me ask you about your expertise in this area because you are a former intelligence chief. You are renowned for your knowledge of guerrilla warfare in Afghanistan. You've written a book on the subject as well. So we see Israel continuing to accuse Hamas of using civilians as human shields. The IDF claims that tunnels were deliberately built under hospitals, schools and places of worship. So in your professional expertise, how much truth is there in that? Can a wall really be waged from the tunnels? And how big of an infrastructure are we talking about here? You know, um, there is a very interesting um, uh, interview that uh, the former Prime Minister of, uh, of Israel, Ehud Barak, gave to one of the news media in which, uh, out of the blue, uh, he, he made the observation that uh, it was Israel who first uh, built tunnels in, in Gaza uh, when they had occupation of Gaza. Uh, please refer back to, to that interview. And uh, the, the interviewer was taken aback and, and totally surprised. And she asked the question again to get uh, Barak to, to clarify that. And he said, yes, uh, we built them when we were in occupation because it made our occupation easier, in other words, to that effect. So uh, building the, 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 the tunnels was, was not just a Hamas idea, but the Israelis, when they were in occupation, used that method as well to further their, uh, their uh, uh, occupation of, uh, of Gaza. I have seen no uh, sp specific evidence of the Israeli claims that these tunnels as you are used as command headquarters uh, for uh, Hamas. Uh, you remember the, the scenes that they showed at the beginning of this uh, recent fighting of uh, going into one of these tunnels and then claiming that, yes, here is the uh, proof of, uh, of uh, military uh, use of the tunnels and showing absolutely nothing. So there has been no evidence uh, other than that the Hamas is using these tunnels, not only for their own protection, but also uh, for uh, um, to move from one place to another. As far as uh, using uh, human beings as, as shields and so on, well, the Israelis uh, don't, have not minded killing their own people, uh, civilians as well, in their uh, attempts to uh, uh, meet the challenge of uh, Hamas fighters. And there's been Israeli news media that have covered this aspect of the, of the initial fighting there that uh, Israel itself is killing their own people in order to kill uh, the, uh, the Hamas uh, fighters uh, in the kibbutzim that they occupied before uh, the Israeli assault on Gaza itself. So uh, the Israelis themselves don't show any concern for human life, even to their own people. And you've seen, remember, the, 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 the two or three uh, Israeli hostages that had come out of, of one of these areas where they were held by the, the Hamas people, and they were shot by the Israeli forces. Uh, so the, when the Israelis claim uh, their, their uh, protection or their consideration for, for human life, uh, let's see what they do before they we take their word for, for granted. Yes, and there's been a lot of criticism that Prime Minister Netanyahu's goal is not to rescue the hostages, but merely to annihilate every last Palestinian. And there is a very real risk that all of these hostages are going to be killed as a result of that. But from the Israeli government's perspective, they feel that the world is biased against it. In fact, a number of Israeli groups say that the UN has paid a disproportionate amount of attention to Israel, citing the adoption of one resolution each by the General Assembly against countries like Iran, Syria, North Korea and Myanmar for alleged human rights violations versus 15 against Israel in just 2023. Do you think that Israel has any right in its claim that the world is biased against it? I think the world has taken its position because of Israeli actions, not because of anything else. Um, I don't need to, to, uh, to justify uh, the world's position. It is Israel that needs to justify its position. Uh, the world has been very, um, you know, 
without the United Nations, Israel would not have existed. Uh, so uh, for uh, Israel, as it were, um, to bite the hand that gave it its existence is, is uh, an incredible irony here. And it shows you the ingratitude of the Israelis towards the United Nations. Uh, but uh, right is right and wrong is wrong. And what Israel is doing is wrong. And the United Nations and the world community are condemning it for its actions. And yet the death toll continues to rise. Now, let me ask you a little bit about Saudi Arabia's position. Just days before the October 7 attacks, it did seem as if their stars were aligning for an Israeli-Saudi normalisation deal. That would recognise Palestinian statehood. Is it safe to say this seems to have now gone down the drain? Or in your circles, are you hearing there may still be some room for negotiations? Could Saudi Arabia use its leverage to stop the killing in Gaza and even release the Israeli civilian hostages? Saudi Arabia is trying to do that uh, to its best ability. Uh, you know, the summit conferences that were held in, in the kingdom um, since the beginning of, the, of the, this conflict uh, indicate that Saudi Arabia very much wants to establish peace and security for everybody and not just for the Israelis. Um, you know, uh, the, the Palestinians are the main victims of the Israeli occupation of Palestine. And uh, achieving their rights and giving them their uh, ability to have their own state and identity it has been the main aim of not just Saudi Arabia, but I think uh, in, in the Arab world in, in general and the Muslim world in, in, in more general terms. Uh, and that has been a goal of the kingdom since the beginning of the conflict, uh, you know, many uh, decades ago uh, and still is. And what I've seen from statements from Saudi officials, from the crown prince and from, uh, from our foreign minister is that um, so-called uh, normalization of Israel, if it were to happen, will not happen before the establishment of a Palestinian state with all of the necessary uh, arrangements for that state to be viable and survivable. And uh, that has been the, the official position of, uh, of Saudi Arabia from the beginning. And let me just refer back to the uh, uh, negotiations that were taking place between uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States uh, before October 7th. You know, when it came to the issue of, uh, of uh, establishing a Palestinian state, Saudi Arabia invited a Palestinian uh, delegation from the Palestinian Authority to talk directly to the Americans, because we never took the position that we will speak for the Palestinians. And so uh, they met, and uh, I don't know what, what uh, uh, events they achieved, but uh, that has been the, the main course of Saudi Arabia, is to let the Palestinians tell the Americans exactly what they want. And uh, that it was the case before October 7th. Since then, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia has reiterated its commitment to the Arab Peace Initiative as the only viable way to achieve total peace between Israel and the Arab world. Well, let's talk a little bit about what led to the October 7 attacks. I know you've said previously that you don't think the attack took place because of any developments on the normalization in Saudi-Israeli relations. So I want to be clear, you don't think this would have been an Iranian-inspired Hamas mission to derail what indeed could have been the deal of the century and ultimately marginalise Iran even more? Well, you know, the, uh, the undertaking such an operation with all of the complicated arrangements that Hamas uh, successfully achieved um, required uh, a lot of time and planning and, and training. And uh, it could not have happened simply because of Saudi-American uh, negotiations pre-October uh, 7th. Um, it, it would have taken at least a couple of years, maybe even more, uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, if there was any effect on uh, th those negotiations between Saudi Arabia and, and the United States on normalization, uh, that would have been a, a marginal uh, addition, if you like, 
to the results of the October 7 events rather than the main reason for it. Uh, Iran, in its support for, for uh, so-called the resistance mode uh, to, to the Palestinian issue, has been ongoing for, for years. Uh, it was not uh, simply initiated or started because Saudi Arabia was negotiating with America on, on uh, normalization with, uh, with Israel. Uh, so uh, all that support that Iran gave to, uh, to the uh, Hamas and other factions in, in Gaza has been going on, as I said, uh, for years. And uh, even uh, Hamas and Iranian uh, officials ha have denied that uh, this operation was inspired by, by Iran. I don't know what the reality is, but uh, they definitely went on record as denying their responsibility for it. But surely Hamas wouldn't have done something at this scale without Iranian blessing. We all know Hamas is an Iranian proxy. Well, indeed, yani, and as I mentioned, yani, Hamas has been uh, supporting, uh, I mean, uh, Iran has been supporting Hamas uh, for many years. Yani, whether there was specific planning shared between Hamas and Iran, uh, I'm not aware of that nor have I seen anybody who has shown any specific evidence of that happening. But definitely, and Iran has been helping Hamas and the other parties in, in, uh, in Gaza and in other places. And what about the Houthi attacks on maritime activities in the Red Sea? There's been attacks just this week on Tuesday. Now, the Houthis say they are in solidarity with Gaza. So far, Riyadh has remained neutral. They've refused to join the US coalition. Are you concerned, though, that the Houthis would nevertheless return to attacking Saudi Arabia? Well, we're always concerned that of any uh, potential threat, not just from the Houthis, but from others around the, our part of the world. Um, definitely, any, um, I have not seen yet any effective means by which uh, Houthi attacks on, uh, on Red Sea maritime uh, activity uh, influencing the fighting in Gaza. Um, the Israelis continue to kill Palestinians uh, in the thousands, uh, and no uh, missile or, or drone or any other attack on any of the shipping in, in the Red Sea has affected that Israeli capability to inflict uh, horrific uh, casualties on the Palestinians. So in my view, it is simply a posturing on the part of the, of the Houthis uh, to, to show that, uh, that they are doing something in their uh, claim that they support uh, Palestinian resistance. But I've seen no, no impact of their activity on the fighting in, in, in Gaza. However, it's uh, had uh, the, the impact of, of raising uh, uh, the uh, insurance rates on, on shipping, uh, in, in not just in the Red Sea, but all around the world, and affecting uh, the world economy in general. And there's talk we could see trade routes permanently change because of these attacks. Indeed, we saw the first civilian lives lost several weeks ago as well. So let's talk a little bit about the Biden administration, their attitude towards the Houthis. We have seen a major U-turn in their policy towards the Houthis since taking office back in 2021. Now, at the beginning, they very hurriedly dismissed it, delisted the Houthis as a terrorist group. They've now returned it to the same list. They've repeatedly been striking these Houthi sites in Yemen. What do you make of this U-turn? Again, you were a former US ambassador there as well. In your opinion, what does it say about modern day US foreign policy? Well, uh, you know, uh, irony is, is, is a good word to describe what has happened in, the, in that, uh, in that uh, consideration. Um, having uh, delisted uh, the Houthis from the terrorist list and, and then, um, you know, working with Saudi Arabia to achieve some kind of, of ceasefire in, in the Yemen and having uh, succeeded in that, uh, the, the, the Palestinian issue uh, impinged on any uh, such uh, considerations, not just for the United States, but for us as well. 
And uh, the United States has shown that when issues affected it directly, they were willing to take the, uh, the, uh, the measures that uh, Saudi Arabia had taken before against the Houthis when they took over in Sana'a. So it's a matter of, of, uh, of uh, self-preservation, if you like, or self-interest on the part of the United States that they change their mind. And uh, I would not be willing to, uh, to try to uh, explain or to uh, understand uh, American um, considerations other than to say that it is very ironic that uh, once having taking that view of the Houthis and delisting them from the terrorist list, and now they're putting them back on it. Uh, very much an irony there. And of course, it's not the first major U-turn Mr. Biden has performed. It's, it's something that you and I spoke about a couple of years ago as well. We all remember how President Biden had promised to make Saudi Arabia a pariah four years ago. Well, it doesn't seem like things went exactly as planned for him. Would you say that relations are now back to normal? And do you think the US position will be forgiven, particularly when it withdrew Patriot missiles from the kingdom as it was being attacked? Well, I hope that uh, the, the Americans realize that uh, uh, such, uh, you know, uh, brouhaha and, and, uh, and uh, hyperbolic uh, positions they take and public statements about, uh, you know, uh, pariah status for the kingdom and so on, uh, really uh, should not be practiced by a big power like the United States but rather to look at reality on the ground and see with mutual interests and where those uh, should be rather than wishful thinking on the part of uh, political campaigning in the United States. Um, we're coming up to an election uh, in the United States uh, in the next few months, uh, and I hope uh, both sides will, will keep that in mind when they're referring to Saudi Arabia. Uh, as you know, the kingdom in previous elections also uh, had been uh, stigmatized by statements from politicians going back to many years, Yanni, but reality uh, subsequently has forced itself on, on American policymakers and made them recognize that Saudi Arabia is a valuable partner for the United States. And therefore, uh, this is how they should look upon the kingdom rather than allow uh, party politics to dictate uh, policy in, uh, in, in the United States. So tell me about your expectations for this year's elections. <laughs> Who would you personally put money on? I'd be very interested to know. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I can, I'm able to say that because it's really a very, very tough uh, contest uh, between two uh, known, uh, known factors, uh, you know, both Biden and Trump are well known to the American people. All the polling that I see is uh, very much undecided so far. And um, uh, we'll just have to wait and see what happens uh, in November of, of this year. Uh, my only wish, as I said, is that both sides consider Saudi Arabia as an important uh, partner in, in maintaining uh, economic uh, welfare for the world, In uh, they're hoping uh, to achieve peace in our part of the world and going forward uh, for the betterment of mankind rather than as uh, a political uh, punching bag that uh, either side can, can f feel free to, to punch uh, every once in a while. Okay, well, let me rephrase that because it's widely <laughs> argued that a Trump administration would be better for the kingdom. Would you necessarily agree? And I guess the counter argument is that so much work has now been done with President Biden that building on that would be better than starting all over again. What do you think? Well, I think that a Trump administration or a Biden administration coming in November um, will have realized that, the, as I said, Yanni, that the kingdom is an important partner. And uh, having gone through the both sides, you know, let's not forget that when Mr. Trump was campaigning back in 2015 and 16, he had some very nasty things to say about the kingdom. And yet when he came to power, he realized that uh, those statements were out of place 
and uh, recognize the reality of a kingdom that is a good partner for the U.S. The same with Mr. Biden. So uh, they both know where Saudi Arabia stands now, and I hope both will appreciate that uh, the kingdom can be uh, an important uh, friend and partner to the United States. And of course, we have seen huge changes in that relationship over the last few years. Well, Prince Choki, thank you so much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We really do appreciate your insights. It's such an important message that you're able to share with us today from the Saudi perspective of what's taking place in Gaza. We certainly look forward to hearing more updates, particularly about the potential of a peace deal, the role that Saudi will play in recognising Palestinian statehood on the global stage in the months and years to come. But certainly an honor to speak with you today. Thank you for joining us. Likewise, I am privileged as well. If I might just add one thing that I think it's important to, uh, to, uh, for uh, your audience to hear and, and to consider, which is that in, in any consideration for uh, uh, peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, if there are going to be conditions placed on who represents who, at around the negotiating table, those conditions should be evenly placed on both sides. And I mean by that, there is talk, for example, about Palestinian uh, representatives in, in negotiations, uh, etc. Uh, who will represent the Palestinians? Uh, so if, if they're going to exclude certain parties from the Palestinian side, like Hamas, for example, because of what it did in October 7th, then they should exclude equally Israeli uh, political uh, parties uh, for what they are doing in, uh, uh, in, in Gaza now. And, and that, in that basis, there should be a fair uh, distribution, if you like, of blame, if that is the right word for it, or representation for, for the Palestinians and the Israelis. So. Um, the Israelis are just as culpable and just as, uh, as uh, uh, vicious have shown, shown themselves as any fighter in Hamas or any of the parties uh, uh, on the Palestinian side. And I have to ask, do you think that is likely? I hope so. I hope we will see a negotiated peace. Uh, as you know, the kingdom is trying very hard and there are other partners in the Arab world and the Muslim world. And now we see Mr. Blinking taking, uh, you know, this uh, shuttle diplomacy. Uh, hopefully he will be successful. Prince Turkey, thank you very much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We do appreciate your time. Thank you.